Chapter 40 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale. The Arabian Nights Entertainments by Andrew Lang. Chapter 40. The princes stood up respectfully, but quite at their ease and the sultan looked at them for a few moments without speaking. Then he asked who they were and where they lived. "'Sire,' replied Prince Baman, "'we are sons of your highness's late intendant of the gardens, and we live in a house that he built a short time before his death, waiting till an occasion should offer itself to serve your highness.' "'You seem fond of hunting,' answered the sultan. "'Sire,' replied Prince Brahman, "'it is our usual exercise, and one that should be neglected by no man who expects to comply with the ancient customs of the kingdom and bear arms.' The Sultan was delighted with this remark, and said at once, "'In that case I shall take great pleasure in watching you. Come, choose what sort of beasts you would like to hunt.' The princes jumped on their horses, and followed the sultan at a little distance. They had not gone very far before they saw a number of wild animals appear at once, and Prince Baman started to give chase to a lion, and Prince Perviz to a bear. Both used their javelins with such skill that directly they arrived within striking range, the lion and the bear fell, pierced through and through. Then Prince Perviz pursued a lion, and Prince Baman a bear, and in a very few minutes they too lay dead. As they were making ready for a third assault, the sultan interfered, and sending one of his officials to summon them, he said, smiling, "'If I let you go on, there will soon be no beast left to hunt. Besides, your courage and manners have so won my heart that I will not have you expose yourselves to further danger. I am convinced that some day or other I shall find you useful as well as agreeable.' He then gave them a warm invitation to stay with him altogether, but with many thanks for the honor done them, they begged to be excused and to be suffered to remain at home. The sultan, who was not accustomed to see his offers rejected, inquired their reasons, and Prince Baman explained that they did not wish to leave their sister, and were accustomed to do nothing without consulting all three together. "'Ask her advice, then,' replied the sultan, "'and to-morrow come and hunt with me and give me your answer.' The two princes returned home, but their adventure made so little impression on them that they quite forgot to speak to their sister on the subject. The next morning, when they went to hunt, they met the sultan in the same place, and he inquired what advice their sister had given. The young men looked at each other and blushed. At last Prince Baman said, "'Sire, we must throw ourselves on your highness's mercy. Neither my brother nor myself remembered anything about it. "'Then be sure you do not forget to-day,' answered the sultan, "'and bring me back your reply to-morrow.' When, however, the same thing happened a second time, they feared that the sultan might be angry with them for their carelessness. But he took it in good part, and drawing the three little golden balls from his purse, he held them out to Prince Baman, saying, "'Put these in your bosom, and you will not forget a third time. For when you remove your girdle to-night, the noise they will make in falling will remind you of my wishes.' It all happened as the sultan had foreseen, and the two brothers appeared in their sister's apartments just as she was in the act of stepping into bed, and told their tale. The princess Parzad was much disturbed at the news, and did not conceal her feelings. "'Your meeting with the sultan is very honorable to you, and will, I dare say, be of service to you, but it places me in a very awkward position. It is on my account I know that you have resisted the sultan's wishes, and I am very grateful to you for it. But kings do not like to have their offers refused, and in time he would bear a grudge against you, which would render me very unhappy. Consult the talking bird, who is wise and far-seeing, and let me hear what he says." So the bird was sent for, and the case laid before him. "'The princes must on no account refuse the sultan's proposal,' said he, "'and they must even invite him to come and see your home. "'But, bird,' objected the princess, "'you know how dearly we love each other. "'Will not all this spoil our friendship?' "'Not at all,' replied the bird. "'It will make it all the closer.' "'Then the sultan will have to see me,' said the princess. "'The bird answered that it was necessary that he should see her, "'and everything would turn out for the best.' The following morning, when the sultan inquired if they had spoken to their sister, and what advice she had given them, 
Prince Baman replied that they were ready to agree to His Highness's wishes, and that their sister had reproved them for their hesitation about the manner. The Sultan received their excuses with great kindness, and told them that he was sure they would be equally faithful to him, and kept them by his side for the rest of the day, to the vexation of the Grand Vizier and the rest of the court. When the procession entered in this order the gates of the capital, the eyes of the people who crowded the streets were fixed on the two young men, strangers to every one. "'Oh, if only the Sultan had sons like that!' they murmured. "'They look so distinguished and are about the same age that his sons would have been.' The Sultan commanded that splendid apartments should be prepared for the two brothers, and even insisted that they should sit at table with him. During dinner he led the conversation to various scientific subjects, and also to history, of which he was especially fond, but whatever topic they might be discussing, he found that the views of the young men were always worth listening to. If they were my own sons, he said to himself, they could not be better educated, and aloud he complimented them on their learning and taste for knowledge. At the end of the evening the princes once more prostrated themselves before the throne, and asked leave to return home. And then encouraged by the gracious words of farewell uttered by the Sultan, Prince Baman said, Sire, may we dare to take the liberty of asking whether you would do us and our sister the honor of resting for a few minutes at our house, the first time the hunt passes that way. With the utmost pleasure, replied the Sultan, and as I am all impatience to see the sister of such accomplished young men, you may expect me the day after tomorrow. The princess was, of course, most anxious to entertain the Sultan in a fitting way, but as she had no experience in court customs, she ran to the talking bird, and begged he would advise her as to what dishes should be served. "'My dear mistress,' replied the bird, "'your cooks are very good, and you can safely leave all to them, except that you must be careful to have a dish of cucumbers stuffed with pearl sauce served with the first course.' "'Cucumbers stuffed with pearls?' exclaimed the princess. "'Why, bird, who ever heard of such a dish? The sultan will expect a dinner he can eat, not one that he can only admire. Besides, if I were to use all the pearls I possess, they would not half be enough.' "'Mistress,' replied the bird, "'and do what I tell you, and nothing but good will come of it. And as to the pearls, if you go at dawn to-morrow and dig at the foot of the first tree in the park, on the right hand, you will find as many as you want. The princess had faith in the bird, who generally proved to be right, and taking the gardener with her early next morning, followed out his directions carefully. After digging for some time, they came upon a golden box, fastened with little clasps. These were easily undone, and the box was found to be full of pearls, not very large ones, but well-shaped and of good color. So leaving the gardener to fill up the hole he had made under the tree, the princess took up the box and returned to the house. The two princes had seen her go out, and had wondered what could have made her rise so early. Full of curiosity, they got up and dressed, and met their sister as she was returning with the box under her arm. "'What have you been doing?' they asked, and did the gardener come to tell you he had found a treasure? "'On the contrary,' replied the princess, "'it is I who have found one.' and opening the box she showed her astonished brothers the pearls inside. Then on the way back to the palace she told them of her consultation with the bird, and the advice it had given her. All three tried to guess the meaning of the singular counsel, but they were forced at last to admit the explanation was beyond them, and they must be content blindly to obey. The first thing the princess did on entering the palace was to send for the head cook, and to order the repast for the sultan. When she had finished, she suddenly added, "'Besides the dishes I have mentioned, there is one that you must prepare expressly for the Sultan, and that no one must touch but yourself. It consists of a stuffed cucumber, and the stuffing is to be made of these pearls.' The head cook, who had never in all his experience heard of such a dish, stepped back in amazement. "'You think I am mad,' answered the princess, who perceived what was in his mind, "'but I know quite well what I am doing.' Go, and do your best, and take the pearls with you. The next morning the princes started for the forest, and were soon joined by the sultan. The hunt began and continued till midday, when the heat became so great that they were obliged to leave off. Then, as arranged, they, re they turned their horses' heads toward the palace, and while Prince Baman remained by the side of the sultan, Prince Perviz rode on to warn his sister of their approach. 
The moment his highness entered the courtyard, the princess flung herself at his feet, but he bent and raised her and gazed at her for some time, struck with her grace and beauty, and also with the indefinable air of courts that seemed to hang around this country girl. They are all worthy one of the other, he said to himself, and I am not surprised that they think so much of her opinions. I must know more of them. By this time the princess had recovered from the first embarrassment of meeting, and proceeded to make her speech of welcome. "'This is only a simple country house, sire, suitable to people like ourselves who live a quiet life. It cannot compare with the great city mansions, much less, of course, with the smallest of the sultan's palaces.' "'I cannot quite agree with you,' he replied. "'Even the little that I have seen I admire greatly, and I will reserve my judgment until you have shown me the whole.' The princess then led the way from room to room, and the sultan examined everything carefully. "'Do you call this a simple country house?' he said at last. "'Why, if every country house was like this, the towns would soon be deserted. I am no longer astonished that you do not wish to leave it. Let us go into the gardens, which I am sure are no less beautiful than the rooms.' A small door opened straight into the garden, and the first object that met the sultan's eyes was the golden water. "'What lovely colored water!' he exclaimed. "'Where is the spring, and how do you make the fountain rise so high? "'I do not believe there is anything like it in the world.' He went forward to examine it, and when he had satisfied his curiosity, the princess conducted him towards the singing tree. As they drew near, the sultan was startled by the sound of strange voices, but could see nothing. "'Where have you hidden your mus musicians?' he asked the princess. "'Are they up in the air or under the earth?' Surely the owners of such charming voices ought not to conceal themselves. Sire, answered the princess, the voices all come from the tree which is straight in front of us, and if you will deign to advance a few steps, you will see that they become clearer. The sultan did as he was told, and was so rapt in delight at what he heard that he stood some time in silence. Tell me, madam, I pray you, he said at last, how this marvellous tree came into your garden. It must have been brought from a great distance, or else, fond as I am of all curiosities, I could not have missed hearing of it. What is its name? The only name it has, sire, replied she, is the singing tree, and it is not a native of this country. Its history is mixed up with those of the golden water and the talking bird, which you have not yet seen. If your highness wishes, I will tell you the whole story when you have recovered from your fatigue." "'Indeed, madam,' returned he, "'you show me so many wonders "'that it is impossible to feel any fatigue. "'Let us go at once more and look at the golden water, "'and I am dying to see the talking bird.' "'The sultan could hardly tear himself away "'from the golden water, which puzzled him more and more. "'You say,' he observed the princess, "'that this water does not come from any spring, "'neither is brought by pipes. "'All I understand is that neither it nor the singing tree "'is a native of this country.' "'It is as you say, sire,' answered the princess, "'and if you examine the basin, you will see that it is all in one piece, "'and therefore the water could not have been brought through it. "'What is more astonishing is that I only emptied a small flaskful into the basin, "'and it increased to the quantity you see now. "'Well, I will look at it no more to-day. Take me to the talking bird.' On approaching the house, the sultan noticed a vast quantity of birds, whose voices filled the air, and he inquired why they, they were so much more numerous here than in any other part of the garden. "'Sire,' answered the princes, "'do you see that cage hanging in one of the windows of the saloon? That is the talking bird, whose voice you can hear above them all, even above that of the nightingale, and the birds crowd to this spot to add their songs to his.' The sultan stepped through the window, but the bird took no notice, continuing his song as before. "'My slave,' said the princess, "'this is the sultan. Make him a pretty speech.' The bird stopped singing at once, and all the other birds stopped too. "'The sultan is welcome,' he said. "'I wish him long life and all prosperity.' "'I thank you, good bird,' answered the sultan, seating himself before the repast, which was spread at a table near the window. "'I am enchanted to see in you the sultan and king of the birds.' The sultan, noticing that his favorite dish of cucumber was placed before him, proceeded to help himself to it, and was amazed, too, and that the stuffing was of pearls. 
a novelty indeed cried he but i do not understand the reason of it one cannot eat pearls sire replied the bird before either the princes or the princess could speak surely your highness cannot be so surprised at beholding a cucumber stuffed with pearls when you believed without any difficulty that the sultana had presented you instead of children with a dog a cat and a log of wood i believed it answered the sultan because the women attending on her told me so the women sire said the bird were the sisters of the sultana who were devoured with jealousy at the honor you had done her and in order to revenge themselves invented this story have them examined and they will confess their crime these are your children who were saved from death by the intendant of your gardens and brought up by him as if they were his own like a flash the truth came to the mind of the sultan bird he cried my heart tells me that what you say is true my children he added let me embrace you and embrace each other not only as brothers and sister but as having in you the blood royal of persia which could flow in no nobler veins when the first moments of emotion were over the sultan hastened to finish his repast and then turning to his children he exclaimed to-day you have made acquaintance with your father to-morrow i will bring you the sultana your mother be ready to receive her the sultan then mounted his horse and rode quickly back to the capital without an instant's delay he sent for the grand vizier and ordered him to seize and question the sultana's sisters that very day this was done they were confronted with each other and proved guilty and were executed in less than an hour but the sultan did not wait to hear that his orders had been carried out before going on foot followed by his whole court to the door of the great mosque and drawing the sultana with his own hand out of the narrow prison where she had spent so many years madam he cried embracing her with tears in his eyes i have come to ask your pardon for the injustice i have done you and to repair it as far as i may i have already begun by punishing the authors of this abominable crime and i hope you will forgive me when i introduce you to our children who are the most charming and accomplished creatures in the whole world come with me and take back your position and all the honor that is due to you this speech was delivered in the presence of a vast multitude of people who had gathered from all parts on the first hint of what was happening and the news was passed from mouth to mouth in a few seconds early next day the sultan and sultana dressed in robes of state and followed by all the court set out for the country house of their children here the sultan presented them to the sultana one by one and for some time there was nothing but embraces and tears and tender words then they ate of the magnificent dinner which had been prepared for them and after they were all refreshed they went into the garden where the sultan pointed out to his wife the golden water and the singing tree as to the talking bird she had already made acquaintance with him in the evening they rode together back to the capital the princes on each side of their father and the princess with her mother long before they reached the gates the way was lined with people and the air filled with shouts of welcome with which were mingled the songs of the talking bird sitting in its cage on the lap of the princess and of the birds who followed it in this manner they came back to their father's palace End of chapter 40 Recording by Dale, Tucson, Arizona End of the Arabian Nights Entertainments by Andrew Lang